Grizzle has the pleasure of interviewing John Champaglia. He's the CEO of Sprout. John, thank you so much for being with us. Well, thank you for coming in. It's great to finally have face-to-face -face interviews again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I just kind of want to start off with the history of Sprout. I know you guys were born out of the 1980s Iran oil crisis and have o over 40 years of successfully investing in commodities. In your opinion, what are some of the core strengths that have allowed Sprout to create great outcomes for clients during these volatile commodity markets? Yeah, I'm always amazed at how many asset management firms were created around 1981. And when you think about that particular time in history, interest rates were almost 20%, inflation was off the charts. And it's amazing how many firms were born in that era of a very difficult investment environment. So, you know, hats off to Eric Sprott for making the, the plunge. And over the years, you know, I think we're best known for all things metals and mining. And over the last few years, we've made a big strategic pivot to stay within metals and mining and I think that served our clients very well. Unfortunately a lot of our competitors over the years have kind of left because of the multi-year bear market that we saw in all things commodities and I'm glad we stayed the course because I think it's paying off in spades right now. And I just want to pivot now to uranium. You guys manage the largest uranium fund in the market, Sprout Physical Uranium Trust. Why was it important for you guys to create this investment vehicle that gave people access to the physical commodity? Yeah, well, obviously it's a very difficult commodity to access directly. It's probably the most regulated thing in the world for obvious reasons. But, you know, I think going back to 2018, Rick Rule, who's our largest shareholder, approached us and said, hey, the uranium market is completely broken. The, the price is $18 a pound. No company on earth, no matter how rich the deposit, could possibly make any money producing uranium. And yet at the same time, it's a critical mineral that produces 20% of uh, US electricity, 10% of global electricity, and all obviously zero greenhouse gas emitting. So, you know, our thesis back then was this market needs to basically reset itself. It was structurally broken. It took us a few years to kind of figure out our way to enter the market and I'm very pleased we stuck with that plan to enter the market and, and in July of 2021 the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust was born. It started with about 600 million dollars of assets and we're just a little over 3 billion so I think it's fair to say the investor response we've had to the Uranium Trust has been absolutely amazing. And now, how do you view uranium fitting into this whole energy transition movement? And do you think everything that's gone on with the European energy crisis has kind of given uranium the recognition it deserves as a reliable, low carbon source of power? Yeah, I do finally believe that it is getting its, its fair share and the narrative has really changed around uranium. I think uh, last year was a real wake up call for the world, you know, in terms of the dual, uh, the dual goals of trying to decarbonize economies. Um, and power generation is obviously a huge part of that, uh, that, that issue. And then second of all, uh, energy security. People really understood what happens when your supply of energy either gets cut off or the price of your fuel can go up you know, tenfold or whatever the number was last year when we, during the peak of the energy crisis. And when you think about the role that uranium plays in nuclear energy, it's a very stable form of baseload power. It always operates. It is, has incredible energy density which means you can store huge amounts of fuel in a very small volume of space, unlike say natural gas or coal. And obviously the world is trying to decarbonize and it's one of the cleanest forms of energy production. So I think investors around the world have kind of figured out this whole, you know, this whole puzzle, which is, you know, decarbonization, energy security and reliable, affordable baseload power. It's, it's a really powerful mix uh, that I think provides key advantages over other forms of energy. Interesting, and I, I just want to shift over to political risks now. I know the European Union and Biden have been threatening to put sanctions on Russian uranium. What's the likelihood of that happening, and how would that impact the price of uranium? Yeah, I think for a lot of market participants, uh, they've been very frustrated because, as you know, uh, the world has sanctioned incredible amounts of, of industries and people within Russia for their uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine. But Right now, nuclear fuel is completely exempt and, and people are, you know, one year in, people are asking the question, why is it still exempt? And the answer quite simply is we don't have any capacity in the West to make up for the shortfall if we were to cut off Russia. Russia's been a longtime provider of not so much of physical uranium, but the services related to the fuel cycle. And if we were to cut those services off, we could be at risk in the West of, of having potential fuel impact. And so until there is capacity built in the West, I think governments and utilities have been obviously been lobbying their respective governments around not sanctioning 
Russian material. So ultimately, we think Russia will get sanctioned, but I think it's going to be a, a multi-year kind of transitional uh, process. And I know no one has a crystal ball, but do you see any other catalysts playing out in 2023 for uranium other than the sanctions? Yeah, I think one of the big things that we're watching is the restart of the Converdine conversion facility in Illinois. And the reason why that's so important is that's been the key bottleneck. Um, and this, this, this particular facility has been closed since 2017. Why has it been closed since 2017? Well, because the price of conversion services collapsed, Russia became a low cost provider, and we basically offshored that service. Now, you know, a, a year into the war, everyone is scrambling to get that facility back online. And what that will uh, allow to happen, we believe, is basically moving uh, the industry from essentially underfeeding in the, in, during the fuel conversion process to overfeeding. And that overfeeding movement uh, which we believe is underway, will basically create additional demand for uranium. And I think a lot of people are waiting for that bottleneck to clear, and that eventually will, will lead to greater demand for uranium. And, and I just want to pivot now to some of your investments. Sprout recently launched four new ETFs focused on the energy transition theme, and I'll, I'll read them out. There's the Sprout Energy Transition Materials ETF, the Sprout Lithium Miners ETF, and the Sprout Junior Miners ETF, and the Sprout Junior Copper Miners ETF. Um, we, we focused on uranium, but maybe what's your outlook on the demand for base metals as this whole energy transition unfolds? Yeah, so it's, uh, I think it's a really fascinating category. I just came back from the Bank of Montreal uh, Metals and Mining and Critical Minerals Conference, which it's now called, and it was amazing to see 2,000 people in attendance, which was the record high in, I believe, 32 years. I think it's fair to say that the interest in mining has come back enormously. This is a sea change in our, in our, from our perspective in over the last two to three years. Two or three years ago, it was very difficult to talk to investors about mining. Why? because everything else in the world was kind of working for them. Technology stocks, you know, an era of very cheap money, levitated a lot of asset classes, and people just weren't interested in mining, you know, for uh, whether the returns were low, the underlying commodity prices were soft, uh, some ESG concerns, and I think it was neglected for many years. And so we now have a situation where all of that underinvestment over the last 10 years is now kind of coming home to roost. And we're starting to see pinch points and, and, and uh, shortages and things like lithium and obviously things like copper becoming harder to find. So the world is looking at this investment opportunity, I think, through a very different lens. And then you have the governments providing very powerful investment signals. The Inflation Reduction Act, for example, which is the worst named piece of legislation ever, <laughs> really should be called Clean Energy Act. There's $369 billion of incentives related to some form of clean energy production or transmission. And that's basically the U.S. government signaling to investors, hey, come and invest here. We want to crowd in your investment. You need to invest in these critical sectors because we need to support renewable energy. We need to, need to support infrastructure and, and nuclear power. And so as, as capital is starting to come back into the sector, investors are taking notice. Commodity prices have obviously, uh, many of them have doubled or tripled or quadrupled in some cases over the last few years. And that's obviously getting the attention of a lot of institutional investors that we talk to, a lot of family offices. But it's still, I'd say, in the very early stages. It's not really the big, big money yet. It's still kind of the smaller, mid-sized institutions and family offices that have been the first movers. But, you know, from the conference, I see, I see the money starting to do their homework. And, when you've, le when you've left a sector for as many years as many investors have, I think uh, many of them are kind of in an education and research process. And, and that's really our job at Sprott is helping people understand these very technical sectors. Well, that's definitely a lot to think about. And thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with Grizzle. That was John Champalia, the CEO of Sprott.